Bibles and turn to Luke 16. Luke 16. Again, we're so thankful you're here this morning. And uh, we're just moving right along. We have baptism coming up as well. Just a wonderful day. A lot of special things going on. Luke chapter 16. Matthew, Mark, Luke. Third of the Gospels in the New Testament. Luke 16. We're in a series entitled Trusting God. Trusting God. And uh, we, we talked about trusting God with everything, trusting God with salvation, trusting God with eternal security, trusting God with daily needs, and today, trusting God with our family. Aren't you thankful you can trust God? Aren't you thankful you can trust Him with your family? To, you know, protect your family provide for your family uh, for for him to love your family I'm so thankful I'm so thankful for God's love that he doesn't leave us he doesn't forsake us did you know he loves your family more than you do he sure does he loves your family more than you can even possibly he loves your spouse more than you do he loves your little baby he loves your grandkids more than you do but I want to talk to, to you about a specific area of trusting God I, I think some of you probably have loved ones who are not saved who um, who don't know Jesus Christ or at least you're not sure about their salvation matter of fact I know some of you have lost loved ones because you've shared it we, we pray for some of those loved ones um, on Wednesday nights and and uh, when we get together for prayer times so I know you do and I know you would do anything you could you would do everything you could to see them come to Christ am I right we want people to be saved but again God wants it even more than we do what Jesus told about a rich man in hell a rich man who had died he didn't know Jesus Christ he was in hell and he was concerned about his family and I want us to read this story so if you found your place in Luke 16 I'm gonna ask you to stand one more time Luke 16 and look if you would carefully focus in on verse 19 Luke 16 and verse 19 it says there was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day and there was a certain beggar named Lazarus which was laid at his gate full of sores desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table moreover the dogs came and licked his sores and it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom the rich man also died and was buried and in hell he lift up his eyes being in torments and seeing uh, and seeth Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom and he cried and said father Abraham have mercy on me send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue for I'm tormented in this flame but Abraham said son remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things and likewise Lazarus evil things but now he's comforted and thou art tormented and beside all this between us and you there's a there's a great gulf fixed so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot neither can they pass to us that would come from thence then he said I pray thee therefore father that thou would send him to my father's house for I have five brethren that he may testify unto them lest they also come into this place of torment father please just bless now help us to focus on your word help us to hear what you want us to hear in in Jesus name amen you may be seated If you happen to have a Ryrie Study Bible, if you look down at your notes, it says this. In this saying, the Lord taught four things. Conscious existence after death. There is a conscious existence after death. And then he taught the reality and torment of hell. And then he taught there's no second chance after death. And then he also taught the impossibility of the dead communicating with the living 
two, the two men in this story illustrate two different lives, two different deaths, and two different destinies. I want to clarify one thing. I used to read this, and, I, and it was sort of confusing to me, but the hell here, this hell, it should be Hades. It's more accurately Hades. Uh, this is not Gehenna hell. This is not the, the lake of fire. These people who have died without Jesus Christ are in a place and they're awaiting their judgment, the great white throne judgment. And then these people will not escape Hades. They'll be cast into hell, into a permanent hell. I guess you an easy way of looking at it would be like a jail cell versus a prison. But you're not going to get out of either one of these. And, and you also notice it is still a place of torment. Well, you can look at this, you can look at all through the Bible, and you will see this. God can save lost people. And He wants to save lost people. That's His desire. He came to save lost people. I want us to, to, to go in this scripture just a little closer, and I want us to look at this, trusting God with our family. And I want to answer three questions. If you have a bulletin, on the back, there's a, an outline, and follow along, fill in the blanks. Number one, the first question, what has God done to save our loved ones? If I'm concerned about my loved ones, what has He done to save my loved ones? Well, we know that every good gift comes from above. One of my favorite verses, every good gift, every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights. Well, here He gives us three gifts that help us to know that he's, what He's done to save our loved ones he's get, you're looking at one of them he's given you the word of God he's given you the word of God do you love the Bible hold them up just for a moment hold your Bible up just for a moment boy you ought to be thankful for the word of God that's God's precious word took some 1500 years uh, for it to, to come together and uh, 40 different authors you have 66 books. You've got a library there that you're holding. 66 books, 39 in the Old Testament, 27 in the New Testament. And it's all the Word of God. Old Testament is important. New Testament is important. Old Testament, New Testament work together. And so we need to study it. But what we do know is that these books, these books, the Bible, and by the way, it's been, they've tried to destroy it so many times through history. Couldn't do it. Did you know that every single year that book you're holding is the best seller? It's the best seller in the world every year. They even take, they took it off the best seller list because it was always number one. But by far, it's the best seller. It's the Bible. It's the Word of God. And we know that this is proof God wants to save your loved ones. The second gift He's given us, it's the work of God he's given us the Word of God but he's given us the work of God what is that well he came from heaven God sent his son here to live a perfect life to die for us why did he come because he loves us he, he was not willing and he's not willing that any should perish but that all should come to repentance he came that's the work of God it's all summed up in John three sixteen. I bet most of you can quote it for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son and I love this, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. God commendeth his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That's the work, the work of God. 2 Corinthians 5, 21, he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. The Bible says that, that the Son of God came, to seek and to save that which was lost that was you that was me that's your loved ones that's your family members who are lost he came that's the work of God it's the completed work of God because he died on the cross shed his blood for us paid our sin debt and then he rose he rose from the dead he rose from, so it's the finished work of God what a gift we have the, the word of God we have the work of God and then number three the will of God he shows us what is what is the will of God well 2 Peter 3 9 it says the Lord is not slack concerning his promise you know what that means that means he's not he's not a, a sluggard he's not late he didn't go to sleep he's not slothful 
uh, somebody says, well, where, why hasn't he come back? I'll tell you why, because he wants people to be saved, including your loved ones and my loved ones who don't know Jesus Christ. Because if the Lord came today, the chances are it's too late. It's too late for your loved ones. It's too late if they've not received Christ as their Savior. So we have the, the will of God. The Lord's not slack concerning His promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. I'm so thankful for that. Some people want to say that, well, God died for certain ones and, and others he didn't. And some people can be saved. Others can't be saved. He chooses certain people. He doesn't choose other people. Foolishness. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And, of course, there's many other scriptures to let us know the will of God. So we have those gifts, the word, the work, and the will of God. That's what God has done. And I'm thankful for what God has done. But what is he doing now? What is God doing now? He's done so much in the past. But what has he done now? Well, look at verse 29. Abraham saith unto him, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they'll repent. And he said unto them, If they'll not hear Moses... If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. So what is he telling us? What's God doing now? Well, we have preachers. That's what I'm trying to do. We have teachers. We have great Sunday school classes. We have wonderful teachers. We have preachers. We have teachers. We have missionaries, even going throughout the world to try to spread the gospel. God's given us that. We have evangelists. Uh, we have soul winners. We have wonderful little gospel tracts. And so we share those things. And that's how, that's how many people, by hearing the word, will come to Christ. Praise the Lord for that. But there needs to be more than that. And let me explain. Have you ever tried to witness to one of your lost loved ones? It's rather difficult, isn't it? I mean, you can try, you can talk, you can argue, you can debate, you can beg them plead with them but you know that's not enough there must be the conviction of the Holy Spirit the Holy Spirit must draw them and so what's God doing now he gives us the conviction of the Spirit write this uh, this verse down right there under point two as an ancillary verse first Thessalonians 1 5 our gospel came in word and power and the conviction of the Holy Spirit. If you got saved, if you are saved, you got saved because the, the, the Spirit convicted you. Otherwise, you're not saved if there's no conviction of the Holy Spirit. So that's what God's doing now. He's, he's, he's sent the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit lives within us. The Holy Spirit grips the hearts of lost people when the gospel is preached. And that move, moves me to the next thing. There's the conviction of the Word. The conviction of the Word. I don't know if you noticed, but I try to share a lot of Scripture. And the reason why is because there's power in the Word. I can stand up here and talk forever. And it's not going to do any good. But the Word is powerful. The Word is strong. The Bible says, and write this verse down, Hebrews 4.12, the Word of God is quick. Powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. That's the Word of God. God is busy desiring and trying to save your loved ones. And He gives us the precious Holy Spirit. There's the conviction of the Holy Spirit. Conviction of the wonderful holy word of God parents you commanded parents train up your child in the way they should go that means with the word of God give them the word 
Again, your training, it, it's, it's good. You know, your thoughts, your, what you've been taught, all of those things are good. But it's not as powerful as the Word of God. The Word of God will change their life forever. I mean, teach them to have good manners. Teach them to be respectful. All those things, that's important. But the Word of God will change their life forever. Share the Word with your family all day, as we talked about. I came across something I want to share with you. It comes from Chuck Swindoll. Gives a little insight on child rearing. I think it's very pertinent for today, seeing some of these kids, these rebellious kids that are committing all kinds of travesties and horrendous sins and shootings and killings. And I'm, I'm like, why? What in the world is going on? Well, what he wrote is this, how to train your child to be a delinquent. A delinquent is a rebellious kid, a, even a lawbreaker, someone that's out of control. Well, let me, let me share with you 10 things that he wrote because I happen to agree with them. You want to you wanna train your child to be a delinquent? Here's what you do. When your kid is still an infant, give him everything he wants. This way he, he will think. This way he thinks that the world owes him a living when he grows up. When, number two, when he picks up swearing, cursing, profanity, off-color jokes, just laugh at them. Encourage him. As he grows up, he will pick up cuter phrases that will really floor you. You know, I was watching a sports talk show just the other day, I, this week, and this, this sports commentator, he announced this he said he was just talking and he was talking about his kids and how they're into sports and everything he said i tell you what the other day i heard my 10 year old daughter curse the tv i mean she went off cursing and it's the first time i ever heard it oh she was she was it's because her team was losing and they just laughed and he was almost it was like he was proud of his 10 year old girl that's exactly what he's saying. You want to raise some rebellious kid? Go ahead and encourage him to use profanity. See how cute it is a little bit later. Number three. You want to train your child to be a delinquent? Never give him any spiritual training. Wait until he's, oh, 21 or so. Let him decide for himself. I couldn't tell you how many times I've heard parents say, well, I don't want to make him go to church. I don't want to make him go to church because he may not want to when he gets older. Why don't, why don't they say that about anything else? I don't want to make them go to school. I don't want to make them uh, brush their teeth or take a bath. They may not want to take a bath when they get older. may not want to brush their teeth. Listen, brushing your teeth is important. Taking a bath is important. All these things are important. Listen to me, but they're not eternal. It's what they do with Jesus Christ that's eternal. And where do we get? Well, we're trying to help parents. We're trying to help teach and train. Oh, you better get them to church. Here's another one. Avoid using the word wrong. It'll give your child a guilt complex. You can condition him to believe later when he's arrested for stealing a car. Just to convince him later, society's against him. He's being persecuted. He hadn't done anything wrong. Number five, pick up after him. Pick up everything. Pick his books up, shoes up, clothes up. Do everything for him so he'll be experienced in throwing all responsibility onto other people. Here's another one. Let him read all printed material he can get his hands on. Let him watch anything on television. Sterilize the silverware, but let him feast his mind on garbage. Number seven, quarrel frequently in his presence. Go ahead and fuss and fight. And he won't, do, he won't be too, too surprised when his home is broken up later. Number eight, satisfy his every craving for food, drink, comfort. Every sensual desire must be gratified. Denial may lead to a harmful frustration. Number nine, give your child all the spending money he wants. Don't make him earn his own or earn anything. Why should... Why should he have things as tough as you did? And then number 10, take his side against the neighbors. Take his side against the teachers. Take his side against the policemen. Everybody's against your little one. 
I better move on before I really get in trouble. Number three. We see what God's done, what God is doing. But number three, I want to change gears here. What can we do? What can we do to help our loved ones come to Christ? And I just want to give you two things. But they're very important. Number one, we must have a burden for them. We must have a a brokenness. Look at verse 27. Then he said, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou wouldest send him to my father's house. I have five brethren that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into his present, this place of torment. Listen, what he's saying is, please do something. Please do something. Don't let my brothers come here. Do you know what, you know what the Bible is showing here? This man has a burden for his brothers. He has a burden for his lost family. Oh, he wants to do anything, anything, anything to keep him from coming to this place of torment anything please send somebody well if you can't do it that way do it another way just get a message to them the thing here's the problem it's too late his burden is too late it's misplaced I mean you should have had a burden earlier it's too late for this man to have a burden we've got to have a burden now the Bible says the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. Oh, God, thou will not despise. God honors a broken heart, a burdened spirit. Sometimes that's the only way to reach a lost loved one is a broken heart. How many people have come to Christ because of the prayers of a mother? or a father, or a grandmother, a grandfather. They wouldn't give up. They were just so serious and passionate about me getting saved. I heard about a godly woman. She was burdened about her husband. Very burdened. Well, there was a revival in town, a revival in her church. She always was at church. She was a faithful woman, faithful to Christ. This revival meeting was going on and people were getting saved. There's her husband lost. So she invited the evangelist to come home, to come to her house for, for a meal. Well, she was preparing. She told her husband he's coming. She put two plates out. And um, her husband said, why is there only two plates? I thought you said he was coming. She said, he is coming. But I'm not eating he said, why not? He said, how can I? I'm burdened for you. She said, any moment you could die and go to hell. She told her husband, I'm not going to eat. I'm not going to eat anymore until you come to Christ. He laughed at her. He said, well, you're going to get mighty hungry because I'm not going to get saved. But it was just a few days later that he was so broken over his sins her husband came to know Jesus Christ Savior and Lord sometimes it's a burden it's a brokenness the Bible commands us he that goeth forth and weepeth bearing precious seed sometimes we go bear precious seed but we're not weeping we're not broken we're not burdened we just go and 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 spread the word but we're not we don't have a, a brokenness we don't have a burden I think that may be what's missing in my life perhaps that's what's missing in your life we're not truly broken I think sometimes we don't really realize hell's real hell is real we love to talk about heaven and rightfully so heaven's real and we could we could be there today brother JC we could go to heaven today but lost people could go to hell today. It's real. Hell is just as real as heaven. Did you know that Jesus Christ made more references to hell than he did heaven? In God's word, Jesus made more references to hell. And yet you have so many people that say, I don't believe in hell. What, do you believe in heaven? Yeah, I believe in heaven. But I don't believe in hell. Then you don't believe the Bible. You can't pick and choose. And again, we have many preachers who are not even telling anybody 
they're not even preaching there's a hell and there's a judgment you know when I look at people I think this I think and I think this about myself I think this about everybody we're gonna be standing before the Lord very very soon any way you look at it even if you live to be a hundred years old it's not gonna be any time to your standing before the Lord I, I know that I know that we're all gonna stand before God it's not gonna so much matter what you watched on television or where you went and what you did all the time what matters is what you've done for the Lord Jesus Christ what matters if you've been obedient to his word what matters really what matters more than anything is if you've come to know Jesus as your Savior and Lord not just a head knowledge but he but he's your he's your Savior and your Lord we must have a burden and then the very last thing we must have a consistent life before them now I don't think anything I've said Harley is more important than this one because I think there's a great falling away right here we must have a consistent life before them what does that mean that means we can't be hit and miss with our Christianity I think sometimes it does more harm than good I think some people are looking at so-called professing Christians and they say you know what if that's what it is I don't want it because he says he's a Christian and he doesn't act like a Christian we, we talk church on on Sunday and we talk trash on Monday and it doesn't work and, and lost people see it and there's they say that's not real it's not real I don't want it and so we're we're hurting the cause of Christ we're actually hurting loved ones we're hurting our own family the ones that we love oh we want them to be saved and we're hurting them because of our inconsistent lifestyle if I call myself a Christian I can't have sin in my life and just I, I just I just you know that's that's what I do I mean everybody's got some some malice some problem in their life I can't do it no I've got to forsake that why because he's he's not only my Savior he's my Lord he's Lord he's Lord listen Lord means Lord of all it doesn't mean Lord of part of your life it's Lord he's Lord of all or he's not Lord at all he may be Savior maybe not if you don't have a desire for him to be Lord I want to tell you something you're not saved you're not saved because the desire the hunger is after righteousness it's to be right with God. It's to be obedient. Does that mean, preacher, that we don't ever sin? Oh, no, that doesn't mean that. I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm proof of that. No, we still sin. But we don't want to. And we try not to. And we're trying to get closer and closer to be like Jesus all the time. Because he's going to come back and it could be real soon. Some of the female members of the early church, they were burdened for their husbands. You know what Peter told them? Peter said your conversation your conduct this is what Peter told him you, you're concerned about your husband your conversation your conduct it, it's got to match your profession you claim to be a Christian you got to you got to be a Christian somebody says well pastor I think you know I want to be a I want to be consistent before my family but they already know me <laughs> I've blown it I've messed up I've, they know me I mean, you know, I haven't done very, very well. And they know I profess to be a Christian, but I certainly hadn't been, been a Christian, been Christ-like. So what do I do? Well, don't give up. First, seek forgiveness from God. Ask Him to forgive you. First John 1, 9 still works. Confess your failure. Confess your failure and apologize to your loved ones. Oh, now this part, I'm going to lose some people right here. If, they've, if you've been inconsistent with your family, your loved ones, the very ones you're concerned to come to Christ, go tell them I'm sorry. What do you mean you're sorry? Because I profess to be a Christian and I have not been a Christian. I've not lived the Christian life. And I want to apologize to you. And uh, no matter what, it'll help you. And then ask God, 
to help you be consistent. We must have a consistent life before others, before our family. You know, as you think about these things, <laughs> it's evident. God has done everything for your loved ones to be saved. I mean, he's paid the price. And he's still working. He hasn't come back. Why? Because he wants others to be saved. That's why. And he's still working. Conviction of the Holy Spirit. Conviction of the Word of God. There's still preaching going on. There's still teaching going on. There's still missionaries. But are you doing your part? Christian, you, if you're really a Christian, are you doing your part? Do you have a burden for the lost and for your family? Are you living a consistent life? Are you really being a Christian? Not only can we trust God with our family, we must trust God with our family. Let's all stand. Maybe there's someone here who's not saved. I don't know your heart. Only God knows your heart. You may have made a profession. You may have been baptized. You may have joined a church or many churches. But have you truly been born again? If not, I encourage you to come. Take my hand. I'll pray with you. You can be saved today. Maybe you want to recommit your life to Christ. Maybe you want to rededicate your life to be more consistent. Maybe you just want to pray for a loved one. Our altars are open if you just want to pray. You want me to pray with you? Father, bless in this invitation time. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.